ज्ञानम परमम ध्येयम नॉलेज इज सुप्रीम so this is what we had this is where we had stopped yesterday we had said that due to the properties of laser light intensity monochromaticity pulsed operation coherence and well directionality you can do many things you can do many kinds of spectroscopy that you cannot do without lasers or at least you cannot do as well without lasers and uh, one of the things that we came uh, we ended with was we said that lasers can give you pulsed operation so we are saying that using lasers you can actually measure fast processes and the question we asked is how fast a process do we need to measure in chemistry and using this iring equation which many of you are going to study if you have not studied already in this course on uh, energetics and dynamics using iring equation we reached the conclusion that the fastest process in chemistry takes place in about 170 femtoseconds so then we stopped saying how do you measure time in femtosecond because as we know very well no electronics can measures such fast times in uh, well directly so we need an indirect method and the method we are going to use builds upon the same kind of principle as what we have studied in the beginning of the course time domain spectroscopy ft spectroscopy okay so this is what it is so first before trying to show you how exactly the experiment works let me uh, depict the principle of the experiment the principle is this let us say this is the ground state of the molecule i'll call this one let us say this is an excited state to which i can excite directly this is two as we will see later on if this is your uh, these are electronic levels then this is called the frank condon excited state and then let us say a bond breaks and this let us say is state 3 which is the bond broken state okay understand what i'm saying so if this is the case then the time i want to measure is associated with the this one right this i'll just write tau this is the time that i need to measure the time required for going from 2 to 3 are we clear time for a bond to break how do i do it one way of doing it well the only way of doing it if you want to measure time is to use an intense pulsed laser when i draw something like this it denotes a pulse y axis here is intensity of light x axis is time okay if you want to draw a delta pulse of course you draw it like this but no pulse is really a delta pulse okay you excite with a delta pulse now let us think of the population of level 2 how does the population of level 2 evolve with time is there any population of level 2 at time 0 if these are electronic levels no right so well uh, initially the population is zero let us say this is where the pulse comes at this time what will happen the moment the pulse hits the molecule all of a sudden population of 2 uh, will build up right instantaneously okay so at this time what happens is population of level 2 goes to let us say this level okay i can call this something like p2 at time 0 so this is the definition of time 0 for these experiments time 0 means the time at, at which the laser pulse hits the molecule clear now then the light goes on and goes off instantly right now what happens what happens to the population of 2 uh, if will de uh, decay exponentially we have seen right so it falls like this not much issue with that and if this is the most efficient process then we can say that the time as a lifetime uh, associated with this will be this same tau 
okay. Now let us ask a different question. How does the population of level 3 evolve as a function of time? Initially there is nothing, then comes time 0, the laser comes and hits, uh, laser pulse comes and hits the molecule. Do I get any uh, population of level 3 at that time? No. What about some time later? Yes, it starts building up. How? From here. What about some time later? It becomes a little more, right? So, what you get is from time 0, you get a rise in the population of level 3. Of course, eventually it decays, okay? Now see, do these curves remind you of something that you have studied in chemical kinetics? Is this not the kind of uh, time evolution of population for the reactant and no? intermediate, intermediate, isn't it? Intermediate. Because it goes up, eventually it comes down. We are only showing the initial time, that is all. So, my job is to find out, let us say, if we can uh, measure population of P3 in some way, my job is to obtain this curve. If I want to uh, determine the population of 2 in some way, my job is to determine this decay. All right? Clear? How do I do it spectroscopically? If you are doing spectroscopy, how, what is the easiest way of measuring population? What is the simplest relationship between concentration or population and a, a spectroscopic parameter that you know? Lambert Beer's law, right? A equal to epsilon CL, okay? So, what you do is this. Now, this is not enough. This beam, I call it the pump beam. Well, basically I should have drawn here. So, this light that comes in to create the excited population, this laser pulse, an intense pulse, that is called the pump pulse. Now, if I use a weaker light, weaker, uh, a light of weaker intensity to probe an absorption of this, or the absorption of this. This is called the probe beam. Let me draw the uh, experimental schematic in the simplest possible manner and let us see if you understand what I am trying to say. Let us say here is your sample. This is the pump beam. an intense laser pulse. What does it do? It creates a population of level 2. Then let us say I use another much less intense beam and I put a detector here, not here. This is the uh, only thing that we need to understand here. I am monitoring the uh, intensity of this probe beam, not the pump beam. Okay. Let us say this probe is tunable. Tunable means uh, I can select wavelength. That you can do, right? Uh, when we discussed absorption spectrophotometer, we said you start with white light, then you put a monochromator and you get whatever wavelength you want. You understand what I am saying? This probe beam is tunable. I can uh, get different wavelengths or different energies in uh, the probe channel. Are we clear? Now let us say the probe is tuned to an absorption of 2. That means it is absorbed by state 2, not by state 1, not by state 3. That is possible, right? Then what will happen? If I monitor absorbance of probe here, then the absorbance of probe should follow exactly the same kind of decay as the population of P2, is that right? So, we are talking about case A when lambda probe is such that it is absorbed by 2 and not 1, not 
3. Are we clear? Yes, Madhu. Excellent question. What Madhu is asking is, you are saying that pump is used to create an excited state population. Now I bring in the probe that is going to deplete the excited state population, right? Does that not affect the measurement? The answer is it does. So if I am to minimize this effect, what do I have to do? I have to use an intense pump and a feeble probe. Suppose this uh, pump takes say uh, 10 to the power 20 molecules to state 2 and the probe takes only 100 molecules from state 2 to some higher level. Then 10 to the power 20 minus 100 is practically equal to 10 to the power 20. Madhu, are you answered? But that is a very important uh, thing to remember when you do pump probe spectroscopy. The probe light has to be sufficiently feeble compared to the pump light. Otherwise, you will have a second pumping which will mess up your experiment. OD equal to epsilon CL, right? I have selected the probe in such a way that it is absorbed by state 2 and no other state. So time evolution of A will exactly follow time evolution of C of state 2, okay? And concentration and number, uh, you know what the relationship is. That's not such a big deal. Na divided by 1000. Similarly, if I take case B, well, the wavelength of the probe light is such that it is absorbed by 3, not by 1, not by 2. Then what will happen? The absorbance of probe will exactly follow the same shape as this one. Clear? And the point to remember is that probe has to be much more feeble compared to the uh, pump. Clear? Can I go ahead? Now, so now in the discussion that we have had so far, what we have learnt is we have uh, built the schematic of one way of following the time evolution of states by using light. But the fundamental problem remains. The fundamental problem is this time has to be in femtosecond. Okay. How do I get time in femtosecond? To do it, what you do is, you, you for the probe also, you use a pulse. How we generate the pulse and all, we will not get into that. Just believe me on this. Let us take this situation. Wavelength of the probe is such that it is absorbed by state 2 and no other state. Okay. Now, let us say, this is my pump, this is my probe. What I do is, I put in two mirrors here and this also I can do the same thing. I can put in two mirrors here and let me say I put this mirror on uh, a translation stage. A translation stage means something that can be moved forward and backward, that is all, nothing else like a small cart that can move in a straight line. So this can move forward and backward. So using a tape, something as simple as a measuring tape, I can decide what the path difference between pump and probe will be, right, okay. So and if this is movable and this is fixed, then what I can do is or if this is movable and that is fixed, does not matter, then what I can do is I can vary the path difference between pump and probe, okay. Now. Now think, this is time 0. Let us say, it will be easier to understand, I think, if you can uh, think the pump is fixed and the probe is moving. This is time 0. This is when the pump arrives at the sample. Okay? Suppose the uh, path length of the probe is smaller than the pump. Then what will happen? The probe will arrive at the sample earlier than the pump. Okay? Let us say, the probe arrives at the sample here 
at that time is there any uh, excited state population right what will absorbance be in that case zero okay so in for this path length absorbance will be zero now let us take a situation where path lengths of pump and probe are exactly matched there is no path difference okay where does the probe in at which point of time does the probe arrive here okay now what will happen now you have a high population of the excited state so absorbance will also be high okay so if i normalize i'll just draw it here let us say this is the absorbance now suppose i change the path length in such a way that the probe pulse arrives at the sample after the pump pulse maybe at this time now what will happen population has decayed from here to here correspondingly absorbance will also decrease so like this by varying the path length in step wise manner so remember it is exactly like your uh, time domain spectroscopy fourier transform spectroscopy what you're doing is you move the so this is the moving mirror this is the fixed mirror right you move the moving mirror to a particular position stop there and make a measurement that is how you get each of these points then move the mirror to another position another path difference make another measurement this is how what you can do is point by point you can build up the time evolution of absorbance of state 2 which is equivalent to the time evolution of population of state 2 and if you match the wavelength of the probe to the absorption of 3 rather than 2 then this is what you are going to get so like in fourier transform spectroscopy once again we use the uh, speed of light to give us a time resolution that is impossible to achieve by using electronics okay this is the principle tell me if you have understood or not all right this is from uh, this is a famous arrow of time uh, drawn by uh, Ahmed Zuel. it's taken from his novel lecture if you want you can read the novel lecture it is available on the web uh, so this is what we are trying to do okay these are the two states i am using pulsed excitation this is where your pump is x axis is time do not forget now what i am saying is this this is your pump then excited state population decays in time like this okay now this is your sample being pumped on one side and a pulse probe light also goes into the sample and what you do is you actually detect the pulse probe light and here what i am showing is the pulse probe light energy is such that it is absorbed by this excited state and nothing else okay so since absorbance is equal to epsilon cl time evolution of this absorbance is going to map time evolution of concentration of this excited state okay now what i am saying is this if you come back here by using uh, suitable optics basically uh, sets of mirrors i can determine the path length i can uh, well uh, i can provide a particular path length for the pump beam i can provide a particular path length for the probe beam right so what i'm saying is i've adjusted the path lengths in such a way that the probe beam reaches the sample before the pump beam has reached so this is the situation here the pump beam comes at this time probe beam has reached before now what will happen there is no population here right so what will absorbance be absorbance will be zero now let us say the probe beam has come here absorbance will still be zero and here it's still zero what happens when the two path lengths are exactly matched no path no path difference is there pump and probe pulses arrive exactly at the same time so that is the time when the pump has created the excited state population which has not decayed at all right that is when absorbance of the probe becomes maximum now if the probe arrives sometime later by that time 
the population has decayed somewhat ok. So, now absorbance will also decay accordingly have we understood now. So, this is how you build this decay point by point by simply varying the path length of the probe with respect to that of the pump or the other way round. ok. I could do it the other way as well. I can uh, delay pump. In fact, in our lab the experiment that we do there we delay pump and not probe because generation of white light is a uh, little uh, touchy affair. We do not want to mess with uh, that arm. What we are saying is that the intensity of the probe is such that it does not significantly alter the population of any state. It only, only goes and samples it. So, when you do an absorption experiment, if you use too intense light, what will happen? Your ground state population will go down, right, and you will get problematic results. Here also, uh, the power of probe is typically kept at 100th or 1000th of the power of pump. So, suppose there are 1000 molecules in the excited state the probe will uh, take maybe one up no more than that. So, the population significantly uh, the population does not change significantly instead of 1000 it is 999 that is all. So, this decay that you see is due to the decay of the excited state population by radiative pathway, non radiative pathway whatever all right. It is simply the decay of the population that would have been even if there were no probe. All the probe does is that it gives you a handle of seeing what the population is at different times, ok. If you use, suppose you use the same pulse, pump and probe, say same intensity, then there will be a problem, yes. In fact, the entire uh, thing will get messed up and uh, you will not be able to interpret your data. So, you have to ensure there is no double pumping. How do I know what is the population there? I cannot go in the molecule and count. Na? So, all I can do is I can measure the absorbance and that absorbance is proportional to population of that state. That is the purpose of the probe. It lets us see how much, how many molecules are there or how much population of uh, is there in a particular state. But we have to use a feeble probe so that double pumping does not happen. Any other question? If not, this is the end of this part of the discussion, this module. We will go on after this to uh, the actual experiment of Ahmed Suhail, okay, right.